This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for the conversation we have today because we're going to learn a lot of things, not just about sugar that you didn't know about, but what it's doing to your body that you didn't know. Our guest today is the best-selling author of the book Sugar Crush, and his brand new book, Unglued, really dives deeper into that and the relationship between glucose and what's happening to our body. Our guest is Dr. Richard Jacoby. Dr. Jacoby, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, sir. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So I'm curious, um, you know, you, you've kind of come into, in writing Sugar Crush, understanding like what sugar does to the body. But I want to kind of start there for people that may not be familiar with that work. You know, what did you discover in Sugar Crush? Well, what I discovered is more of what I thought was wrong in, in detail. Mm. So I was trained by Dr. Lee Dellen at Johns Hopkins a little over 20 years ago in the concept of decompression of nerves or diabetic neuropathy. And that's a big word, but basically people that have numbness, tingling and burning in their feet, it's a chemical reaction attributed to sugar, but there was a missing link that I eventually figured out. So Dr. Dellen said to me, and not, not such a nice tone in the beginning, because he said, why don't you figure it out if you think there's more to this theory, his theory sure. of nerve compression. But I took the challenge and I got lucky. and I found a doctor at Stanford about 15, 17 years ago, Dr. John Cook. He's a cardiologist by training and he's got a PhD in vascular biology and he studies one molecule. I won't belabor you with that molecule for the moment, however, it is true that that molecule does interrupt the blood flow in the autonomic system to the nerve and blood supply. Mm -hmm. So what I found what, by working with Dr. Cook at Stanford is that it's not just a peripheral neuropathy problem that most people think it is, diabetic neuropathy. The second thing I found was that these names that we give these areas of inflammation are just a construct of medicine over the last four or 500 years. Alzheimer's, autism, diabetic neuropathy, they're all the same disease caused by the same process, just a different location. Now we know about epigenetics, which means you have different genes than I do. And if you eat sugar, maybe you get gallbladder disease, or maybe another person gets a migraine headache, the location of the inflammation. So that's my basic theory. So that's interesting. I, and I guess I could be wrong or I could be right about this, but I'm curious. So like here, here, here would be my question. So like my wife can't have sh a lot of sugar because it's ter it messes with her teeth. If I have it, it doesn't do anything to my teeth, which is really interesting. And I guess is, is that kind of like a similar type of thing you're saying where everybody's kind of affected differently? I think so. So with what well, we have this word diversity, it's mm -hmm. true. We have to have different genome. Well, we all had the basic genome. Epi, which means above the genome, you have a few, they're called alleles, which are a couple little coatings that if you come in contact with sugar um, and you don't have a lot of alleles, like on your teeth, doesn't bother you. Your wife, it does. Mm -hmm. Well, I use a metaphor is that let's say tomorrow morning there was a meteorite hit planet Earth. And I guarantee you somebody's going to be able to breathe sulfuric acid. Not many, but enough for the species to survive because they have that genetic code that allows they'll, they'll wake up and say, what a wonderful morning, sulfuric acid to breathe. The rest of us are going to be dead. Right. And that's what's happening with sugar. The human genome has never been assaulted by this molecule. And I know people say, well, wait a minute, sugar has been around forever. Never in this amount and specifically high fructose corn syrup. It's a poison. So I, I guess understanding that, like, and it doesn't seem like this is widely known as well, because it seems like a lot of doctors don't talk about sugar the way you do. 
I'm curious, like, why aren't we really doing anything about this as a society as a whole? Because we look at it and um, I, I was watching... Uh, I get sucked into these inter internet ads. I can't. I can't help it. And, and Dr. Gundry was walking through um, the fruit section of a of a store, and he was talking about like how fruit now has so much more sugar than fruit did, you know, many years ago because how it's grown and everything. So I guess like knowing this, why are we pumping more sugar into our systems then? Money. Mm. Money. Yesterday, ironically, I had a party for a friend of mine who's a doctor who had just been diagnosed with cancer and severe stage four lung cancer that spread to all out of his body, bone, oh liver, gosh. brain. And within a month, and I talked to him about this dietary uh, aspect of it. Now he's going to Mayo, he's going to get all the famous new drugs, $60,000 a month, by the way. Oh my gosh, who could afford that? It really, like no one. for the regular person, they couldn't afford that. Exactly. So I said, what did your doctor tell you about diet? Nothing. So ironically, yesterday I was preparing for the party and I was in, I won't name the grocery store, but they're all the same. Mm -hmm. And I was going through the grocery store and I was just looking at people and looking at the baskets of food they had in their carts. And I thought to myself, there's nothing in the store that doesn't have sugar as a component, even the meat, because cows are fed corn, which is sugar. Cows don't eat corn. Mm -hmm. But that's the only thing for dinner. That's what they're going to eat. They produce a very toxic omega-6 fatty acid. So that's in the book, but I won't get into the detail. Sure. But the important part of that story is I walked to the back of the store and guess what's there? An enormous drugstore, pharmacy. Yeah. Well, these same people that had bread and cake and all this crap in their basket are lining up to the pharmacists to get a drug to lower their sugar. Well, they should lower their, the basket they have. Don't eat it. Yeah. We're not being told that, and especially with cancer. And he, my friend, has it, it got a PET scan, which most people don't even know what the word means. Or, and I don't think doctors do either. It's a, pet, a positron emission tomography fancy word for we're looking in the body with a radioactive sugar iv and then do a scan and see where those uh, hot spots are and what are those hot spots it's where the cancer is eating sugar 20 to 30 times the amount of sugar for the cancer cell as opposed to the non-cancer cell and never tell the patient that sugar take it away they will live if they give them sugar the cancer cells will live and you will die, no matter what drug you take. And that's a crime. I, I've right? heard that widely ranging. I don't know if you're familiar with the, wor the work of Dr. Patrick Vickers, um, but he does a lot of alternative research on cancer. And one of the big things he's, he's talking about is, is kind of how cancer feeds off sugar. And I guess if we've started to discover that, like, why aren't we like kind of resetting people with a more alkaline diet then at least give them a fighting chance? Well, I think it's the Food and Drug Administration. And that leads to another subject, which is stem cells, which Unglued talks about. Yeah. Food and Drug Administration is one administration. So you have the food, which is causing, which is poison, causing all the diseases, in my opinion. And then you have the drugs, quote unquote, which are supposed to solve that equation, but they don't. And they're slow walking and blocking the greatest natural substance ever invented, and that's stem cells which Lucy, if you believe in that evolution, 3.2 million years ago, she has passed on our genes and here we are. And that tissue, perinatal tissue after birth is the magic formula that treats just about any inflammatory disease. But the FDA is blocking it. Why? Because it works. And big pharma, that pharmacy in the back of that, that store would go out of business. So we have a conflict of interest of a magnitude that's never been seen. And, and so that's what the book Unglued is about. Teaching people about what's causing your problem, teaching you that these drugs are not working and they're horribly expensive. Mm -hmm. And we need, a, we need a conversation. It's really interesting, too, because um, and it's a lot of it's outside of the U.S., too, which kind of fits with what you're talking about. Is I, I know friends that have had you know, treatments for strokes and different things like that. And, and they have to go outside of the U.S. to even get the quantity of stem cells that they would need 
in order to have a successful treatment. So it's, it's interesting that it's like, well, we'll authorize the treatment, but not good enough to help you. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've been to lots of these stem cell clinics around the world. Specifically is Dr. Reardon's clinic in Panama. Mm -hmm. And what does he do? It's interesting. He has a clinic in Dallas and a clinic in Panama. In Panama, he uses umbilical tissue. Now, what's different that he does down there, he takes the umbilical tissue, which is um, loaded with stem cells, grows them in a broth to increase their numbers and then inject, injects an IV to patient. I'll tell you an interesting story of being down there, and this will be in the new book, Unglued. And I'm at his clinic, which is, by the way, just a beautiful country, mm. very modern, not Noriega's country of 50 years ago where it was drug dealers, but very modern, and his clinic is uh, very modern. And I was in the cafeteria looking at some of the autistic kids there, and there are a lot of them he treats. And I saw this one woman and her kid was there. He was about 12, 15 years old. And literally he was eating like a dog. And she was bringing him muffins and orange juice and all this sugar laden stuff. But she was not alone. There was kids from all over the world, from India, Africa, Canada, South America. They all looked the same to me and they were all eating the same. So I went up to her and I said, is this your first time to this clinic? She said, no, it's my third. I said, why would that be? Well, I said, does it work? Of course it works. Well, give me an example. This kid could not speak and she would, and Dr. Reardon gave him the umbilical tissue IV and within three days he's speaking. And I don't know why I said this. I said, what did he say? And the kid said, I want a donut. Oh, he no. Is addicted to sugar. <laughs> and why couldn't he speak? Because the hypoglossal nerve, which is in, right here, the mm -hmm. 12th cranial nerve, innervates the tongue. Mm. The tongue is a muscle used in speech. And if this nerve is not functioning, this tongue does not work. If this nerve here innervates this muscle, then this function does not work. Look at the difference. There's, there's no difference. This is autism. This is carpal tunnel. And that's my thesis. It's all the same, all caused by sugar. It's epigenetics and stem cells work on anything because I say stem cells don't speak English. Now I went to Panama and now I know they don't speak Spanish either. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, one of the things I, I wanted to kind of dive into, because I guess to, to solve any problem, we have to be speaking the same terms, right? And I, and I think one of the issues is, you know, not just the FDA, but also the USDA and a lot of things and, and how sugar is looked at and regulated and things like that. So I'm curious, when we look at it, like how much sugar is hidden in our foods, how much sugar is wrongly classified in our foods? Because if, if we don't know that, then we're kind of playing a losing game. So I want to kind of start there. Well, you're correct. USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. I looked at them very specifically. I was kind of shocked at this. They were formed in 1865 because there really? was a problem. Yes, I was shocked because as the population in the United States moved from the eastern cities out to the west, well, the food took a long time to get from, say, Illinois and Texas and wherever to get back to Boston, Philadelphia and New York. And it rotted. So the mm. government stepped in from the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Now it's come be become a huge bureaucracy it, and it's not protecting us. But it was, it was a good thought, 1865. So it's a collusion between ex-employees, big government, big pharma, big farming, and we have a huge problem. And it is the food, although it tastes great. Yes, it does. All that sugar, it tastes great. And that's why it's addicting. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a huge problem. But the other problem I found is most of our number one institutions for medicine are controlled by big farming and big pharma through the NIH, another government organization, National Institute of Health, dominated by our good friend, Dr. Fauci. Oh, he's a good guy from what I've heard. <laughs> uh, if you ask him, if you've read Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s book, he's a great guy. <laughs> well, let's think we're right into that. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., what a courageous person. He's running for president. Yes. 
his what his uncle was assassinated and his, yeah, he's, he's Bobby Kennedy's son Bobby Kennedy's son so his uncle John Kennedy assassinated his father assassinated now he's going to step into that arena I think there's a big connection between that danger what he's doing and he needs to be heard now I'm not a proponent of either party but he is a tremendous voice that needs to be heard mm-hmm and that's all it is. We need a conversation to get to the root of this problem. But Big Pharma and all these big agencies have a different agenda for us. So how do we how do we find the sugar, though? Because I think the thing is, too, if, I, if, if we don't know where to look, we're going to keep committing the same problem. Because I mean, you mentioned like the muffins and things like that. But like, I guess when I'm looking at a label, like, are there certain things I should be aware of? Are there certain places I shouldn't be buying food from so that I actually know what I'm getting? Yes. So here we can talk about the ketogenic diet, the carnivore diet and and the standard American diet, which is SAD, S-A-D. So here's what they've done. We have all these laws about food labeling, but it's very simple. Divide four into the total number of carbohydrates. That's all you have to do. So let's say yogurt. That's Mm -hmm. a very healthy food, right? Non-fat nonsense. It's all sugar. Uh, If you look at the label at Costco, it's all sugar. All sugar. So let's say yogurt has 26 grams of carbohydrates. Divide four into that, and you have the number of teaspoons you have for that particular thing you're eating. Mm. Human being cannot simulate, process more than one teaspoon, four grams of sugar at any one time. Any level over that is toxic and a poison. So that's why the insulin levels go up to get rid of this sugar out of our diet. So you're looking at labels. I don't think there's anything in the store you actually can buy other than meat that's grass fed, which is a very small percentage. So that's the carnivore diet. Now, most people just say that's crazy. Well, it's crazy because they've been educated into ignorance by another agency called the National Education Association, NEA. Isn't it amazing all these acronyms we have for employees, servants, public servants, is that what they call themselves? Mm-hmm. That work for us who are trying to kill us. <laughs> and with our own money. So they're yeah. taking our gun and shooting us with this nonsense. We need a revolution. Robert Kennedy, congratulations. Great voice. This episode is sponsored by My Pillow, um, my favorite product that I take with me absolutely everywhere. I just spent a week up in Lake Placid, New York, on a ski vacation, and uh, I actually have an extra My Pillow we leave up at the cabin. Really exciting, and uh, keeps me from having neck trouble when I travel. So if you have that and uh, you want to prevent that, <clears throat> you can use my promo code, which is CYOL, and get up to sixty-six percent of select products at MyPillow.com. Up to 66% off select products. Go out and grab my favorite product, which is the MyPillow Classic. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Also, this week, I am on Dr. Jason Dean's uh, new detox, as it's the full moon is coming up on the 6th of January, which is very, very soon. And uh, we are doing our detox of different parasites that are in our body. So if you guys want to join me on the parasite cleanse and uh, cleanse your body from those creepy little creatures that are crawling in there and causing a lot of conditions you're dealing with, you can head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L. You get a discount over there as well. I believe it's about 20% if you use my promo code. So that is bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L. So I, I guess looking at that then, like there's understanding and you, you said you're going to, this is discussed further in, in Unglue, but I do want to get a little bit into that here. You know, there's understanding what is in, which the sugar's in, but at the same time, like, I guess when damage is done and you were talking about stem cells. So I guess when we're looking at that then, you know, what do stem cells do as it relates to, you know, damage from sugar? And, you know, I guess what sort of things are they fixing? Well, that's a great question. I asked that question myself. I've been on a quest in the last 10 years trying to figure that out. It's very simple. 
stem cells, and we have to define that word. So you have stem cells because you're a lot younger than I am. So I could drill a hole in your bone, pull that aspirate out. That's called BMAC, bone aspirate. You have stem cells. Mm -hmm. So when you're born, born, you have millions of cells. And by age 22, roughly, you're fully grown. And then that curve goes down. Age 50, you've lost 90% of your stem cells. I'll, I'll be 40 in a couple of years. So I, okay. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know where I fall careful. on that. <laughs> you better be but you can use your own stem cells. So yeah. they're called autologous because they're your own. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, the FDA was suing these doctors in California that that's a drug. Mm. Your own cells. Well, that's wow. not a drug. It's your own cells. Well, they lost that argument, by the way. Mm -hmm. So now you can use your fat derived. They're, they're, every tissue in your body has stem cells. But well, I've had not, the, I've had, the, I think you and I have talked about this previously. I've had the PRP done, the platelet rich plasma, where they take your blood out and spin it. And I haven't had a knee problem in like four years. Yes, because you're young enough for that. So yeah. PRP, which has not stem cells per se, but have mm -hmm. massive amounts of growth factors. And that's a whole mm -hmm. other subject, very complicated. Sure. But bo bottom line is like, if you had a um, injury to your knee, there's like a, a house fire in your knee. So the fire engines get there and they say, what's the problem? And they put the fire out with the foam, that's stem cells, whether it's mm -hmm. PRP, amniotic, placental, whatever. Yeah. But at the same time, if your knee is malaligned and you are eating tons of sugar, it's like pouring gasoline in your knee. Mm -hmm. So the growth factors that are going to go in there and assess the damage, pull out the drywall, get a new plumber to come in, blah, 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 and repair the damage that you created with your diet and, and bad mechanics. That's uh, simply put. So what are stem cells? They're primarily anti-inflammatory. They work in the paracrine system, which is, people know the endocrine system. Paracrine yeah. system is that cell-to-cell -cell communication. And the second thing they do, which is amazing, they break up scar tissue. So let me go back to the word glucose. And that's why the book is called Unglued. And this is an epiphany for me as well. So I was at a think tank because they want to make Unglued into a Netflix docu-series. Oh, so cool. we're in Hollywood with the Hollywood types. And I'll be there next week. So I have to get my special Hollywood clothes out. Anyway, <laughs> they're grilling me about what does the word glucose mean? And I said, well, I gave him the biochemistry answer. No, what does the word mean? I, you know, I didn't know. I never looked that word up, so I did. Glucose specifically is a Greek word that means to adhere, to stick to. Okay. It's glue. That's okay. what glucose means. So when that glue goes through your body biochemically, it sticks to every one of these nerves, cuts off the blood supply. So if it's your eye, we call it macular degeneration. If it's your big toe and you got gangrene, you have diabetes, that's diabetic polyneuropathy, big word, different location. Or as I said, autism, the hypoglossal nerve, or MS, the, the vagus nerve, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have in the lexicon of medicine, probably 25,000 diagnoses to describe the same thing. Wow. And it's so confusing. Doctors just go to that and code your, your disease. That's how they get paid. Never, never addressing the cause because there's really no money in that. It's sugar. That's wild. Cause I like, I guess it would, you know, it would go back to what we talked about about markers, right? If a person has a marker and they get enough glucose and that would cause a problem or, you know, if somebody else's body processes it differently, they're going to have more of an issue with, you know, whatever part of the body it's stuck to more. That is that kind of the concept? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So when I'm lecturing on my field, which is diabetic neuropathy, and there'll be other doctors in the audience or on the podium with me. And I remember this one doctor, he's a super doctor. I won't name his name, but he's the world's leading authority uh, on facial nerves. So he, his, his subject is he's an animation doctor. I said, animation doctor, you work for Disney? No. <laughs> so people have strokes and have Bell's palsy. There's another guy, Dr. Bell. He noticed that people that had a problem with this particular facial nerve, then they were drooling. Well, what's mm -hmm. the lip? This is a muscle. If it's not working from this nerve, and, I, and he's agreeing with everything I said, 
And I said, well, Bell's palsy part. Well, not that nerve. I said, what do you mean, not that nerve? Because that's his nerve that he's the authority on. So only the facial nerve is not part of his theory because it's different. And every doctor I run into, even like Dr. Perlmutter, a great neurologist, put his name on the front of my book, which I have right here, and he's on the front of the book telling people how great the book is, but does not really agree or understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So his theory is that inflammation caused by sugar affects the brain, mm -hmm. which is Alzheimer's. That's another guy like Bell, early 1900s. Why are these people losing their memory? Did the autopsy, what are these spots? Alzheimer's. That's not a disease, and that's an effect of sugar. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. The first symptom of Alzheimer's is loss of smell. That's the olfactory nerve, another nerve. I mean, it's the same thing. This, I mean, this is my theory. So that's interesting. So I, I guess the question I would have then, um, and you know, I, I apologize if I'm slow on this, but it's how my brain's kind of working now, is like looking at it then, would sugar building up then start to have a degenerative effect? And if it is degenerative at that point, is it just that you know it needs to be regenerated with a stem cell, or is it kind of like taking a toothbrush or something and removing it? Oh, I like both analogies. <laughs> yeah, I think you nailed it right on. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I guess my ignorance asks makes me ask basic questions. Well, see, that, that's exactly my point because it's that simple. Mm -hmm. So let's say formula for kids mm -hmm. instead of breast milk, which is fat. So we take soy and some other nonsense, put a lot of sugar in it, and the kids love it, of course. They get diseases in their childhood. Mm -hmm. So over time, well, I have two. I have two breastfed kids. We, they, we we didn't do formula with either of them. Well, see, that's a smart thing to do. But yeah. your doctor probably tried to push you away from that. A lot of doctors say no. That this is better. No, it's not. So my point is, the sugar is inflammatory, mm -hmm. and it goes through phases depending on what gene set you have. Epigenetics is going to affect different tissues. So th that causes scar tissue. And over time, the scar tissue builds up, builds up, builds up. So the stem cells eliminate the inflammation and dissolve the scar tissue. So the function of whatever that is comes back. Mm -hmm. That's why this kid, autism, another name, that's not a disease. It's an observation of a cluster. Well, it's, a, of it's a catch all is what autism is. It's they, yeah, they put a lot of know, things into it. Right. Um, Spectrum disorder. Well, that's they're not telling you what the rest of the spectrum is. Sugar, and then you see different symptoms, a, a constellation of symptoms. So we see it as that. Well, then we cycle babble these kids. You know, well now let's teach you how to speak and let's do this, let's do that. Well, why don't you just stop giving him the sugar? Oh, he loves the sugar. I want to do everything for my kid. Well, you're killing him. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not well liked in these communities, by the way, <laughs> but I am telling you the truth mm -hmm. and it's a national disgrace. Now, I'll tell you an interesting thing on the stem cell. There's a paper that is and you can look it up. Your audience, audience can look it up. 2003 Senate hearings on non embryonic stem cells. 2003 chaired mm -hmm. by John McCain. Mm the late John McCain, who died of a glioblastoma, which is another sugar-laden issue. So I went back and read the paper, 62 pages. This is what they were asking these scientists, does this stuff work? And the answer was absolutely. Is it safe? Absolutely. Autism, you should have seen the diseases they were describing. They were using the words miracle, Unbelievable. That was 2003. Wow. What happened? Autism is cured. Muscular dystrophy cured. What are you talking about? Why is it not mainstream? Well, the, the, the rates of autism are higher than they've ever been now. Ah, interesting, dude. Yeah. <clears throat> are you familiar with Stephanie Seneff? She's a previous guest of the show. Really? Yes. I taught her everything she knows. knows. <laughs> no, really. Uh, she actually taught me the biochemistry of the shikimate pathway. Hmm. So we were going to do a book together, and that book was called Gut Check. But my book, Sugar Crush, 
I'm not sure she fully understand my concept. She's not a medical doctor. She is a physicist. And she knows the shikimate pathway and the biology, and she knows the chemistry for sure, and she taught me. But I was telling her that that's the root cause, glyphosate is their active ingredient in the corn product that make high fructose corn syrup. But you have to follow that equation all the way down to Dr. Dellen's theory of nerve compression. So I know I was trained by Dellen. I was really trained by her in the chemistry of the shikimate pathway of the microbiome. And yeah, she's a fabulous person. I didn't know you had interviewed her. Yeah, so that's the connection to her. So I call, and this may be a little crude, I call her dot in my theory mm -hmm. because the shikimate pathway glyphosate, how it's grown from corn, then fed to animals and then fed to us Change the dysbiosis, the term she likes to use, and then it affects the vagus nerve and it gets throughout our whole body. Mm. And that's part of the equation I just talked about. But she does not know what nerve compression means because that's not her field. I understand what she's saying. I'm not sure she understands me. Well, you know, you know, what's interesting, though, is 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 when you look at it, too, there's also like. You know, there's direct causes like you're talking about, like, you know, like, OK, so uh, a nerve in the face or, or something like that. But there's also like the indirect other conditions that are caused. Right. Like, let's say you have inflammation in one area for a long time. Well, it can cause, uh, imp you know, an issue in a sympathetic area or something like that. Or you have somebody that, you know, has a, a nerve condition while they're driving a car. So th it, at the same time. There's also a lot of other things that are probably caused we're not even looking at. I don't know if that's something you considered. Yeah, I, I, I do think that is true. And I made this comment to Dr. Cook when I was up at Stanford because I was asking him about cardiovascular disease. After all, he's the number one scientist in that world. And I said, Dr. Cook, help me understand this cholesterol problem. Now, I have my own opinion, and I didn't want to offend him. I thought he would give me a different answer. But this is the answer he gave me. This is, he said, the lining of the blood vessel is like Teflon. When you eat sugar, it makes it like Velcro. I can't make, he couldn't make it any simpler. Mm -hmm. So I said, Dr. Cook, so you're saying cholesterol is not causing the problem? He said, correct. Wow. Cholesterol is a signaling molecule. It comes from the liver to go to the area of inflammation and that plaque, which is built up on the, on the lining of the blood vessel, if you keep eating sugar, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker, and that includes it. So what does Big Pharma answer the question with? Let's lower your cholesterol. Mm. Cholesterol is not the problem. It's like, that's like saying, let's get rid of ambulances. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Well, there's an accident every day outside the, your window, and you hear that si uh, siren signal yeah. and you look out the window and you say wait a minute every day there's an accident and i see this vehicle called an ambulance and that must be cause mm -hmm. and i can do something about that by eliminating ambulances and i can make money with that that's a mm. stop drug to lower cholesterol what does cholesterol do to heart disease nothing it's there as a protective agent and lowering it causes immense problems. So when you ask me, what are the, all the uh, other co-founding co problems? That's one of them because you're ruining the defense system. I don't know if you know this, statin drugs reached $1 trillion in sales. Wow, no, not I did not billions, know that. Trillion. So the whole medical profession, basically, if you ask me point blank, it's a false flag. Started back with Ansel Keys, I'm sure you know that name, back mm -hmm. in the 60s, 70s. He's the guy, another government agency, by the way. He went to Europe on Europe, well, you weren't alive then, but I was. And he spent the summer in Europe trying to figure this out with his girlfriend, who was a phle phlebologist, drawing blood. Anyway, long, long story short, he called it the seven country story, the study that it was fat, cholesterol, and that's where this all started. Now, you can't blame big pharmacy for doing this sort of thing because that's where the money is. But now here we are with the pandemic, 
the vaccines. And I got my own opinions on the, I shouldn't say my own opinions, it's sugar as well. Yeah. People don't, I mean, sugar. People love sugar and so do viruses. They need sugar, glucose, to live. If you give it to them, they will live and you will die. It's that simple. It's Actually. just wild though, too, because I like I'm in I'm in New Jersey, and uh, you know one of our things we do here in New Jersey in the summer we like to go to the beach, right? And uh, I I just going to the beach is kind of a scary experience now. When you just see the the way these people eat, you're like dear dear God, he's like Martians. They are, um, yeah, Jersey, sure. I'm from Jersey. You from Jersey? I'm from Jersey. I, I'm, from, I'm from Northwest Jersey, so we're kind of like being from Pennsylvania here. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm from Ocean City originally. Okay, so you're down by the shore. Yeah, I'm on the shore, so I know, and no one else says the shore, by the way, in the world. It's the beach. It's the beach. At, well, why is it New Jersey? It's the shore, just so we can say it that way? I, I, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Well, doc, Dr. Jacoby, I've really enjoyed this conversation. So once again, the book that is coming up is called Unglued. You know, where can people find out more about that and where can people find out more about you? Okay, it should be out sometime in the summer for that shore read, the beach read. Um, but I don't have an exact date yet, so it's pretty soon. Very cool. Well, Dr. Richard Jacoby, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank you.